recording in progress. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you and welcome back. Uh, it's, been, it's been too long. Um, the Haftorah we have the privilege of studying this week is found on page 1131 in the back of the stone Chumash. It is, the, uh, it is from uh, Yeshayahu, Isaiah 54, all the way through um, uh, 55, verse Hey. Um, as I just mentioned, we've actually looked at this Haftorah four times so far. Yeah. We looked at it once, Parshat Noach last year. We looked at it when we read the split um, during the Shivan and the Chemsas, during the seven uh, uh, prophecies of consolation, we actually read it split into two. Um, and so we sort of looked at it in, from those eyes, but we're going to look at it from, through different eyes today. Um, I'll just note that the Svartic tradition um, really stops in the middle. And this Haftorah is, is comprised of two Haftorah. One is Rani Akara, uh, the barren woman rejoiced. Um, and Aniya Saora, um, oh, afflicted, tossed one, right? As we, I think we talked about last time, we'll talk about it again. Uh, this is <coughs> a perfect example of Isaiah's punny, punny nature in presenting the word Aniya Saora, um, where Aniya means, uh, uh, oh, afflicted one, Saora is storm tossed. A, a cognate of that word uh, is onia, which means a boat, uh, the storm tossed boat. So we're sort of getting both imagery here. Um, and as, as we'll look at face value, and I think I said this over the summer, at face value, the simple connection to our Haftorah, to our Parsha from our Haftorah, is that it mentions Noah, and we have a, 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 a elongated water theme that sort of carries through this Haftorah. But of course, uh, the rabbis weren't just looking for a mad lib of where we talk about Noah and water and then connecting to our Parsha. It's a much deeper connection that we'll explore today. So uh, let's begin. Um, and really, there are two focuses which I want to look at today. One is uh, more technical, where we're going to look at just a uh, uh, complication in um, the commentaries trying to read a pasuk and different uh, uh, goals bringing to two different readings um, and just looking at how that happens and what that means and how they contend with that. The second is to look at these two Haftoro in the two uh, different um, um, units that we have that we read together as one and try to understand, A, what are the units telling us very broadly and why are we reading them on this, on this Haftoro, on this job, right? So let's start with that second one first and then we'll dive in. Um, so the first one is, uh, the first we begin, Pasuk uh, 1, verse Aleph, uh, Perak Nun Dalet, 54. Rani um, Akara uh, Lo Yalada. And we read of the sing out, O barren one who has not given birth. Pisli Rina Vitali Lo Chala. Break out into a glad song and be jubilant. Um, uh, o one who has not had the uh, labor pains, the barren one, Kirabim, because so many are the Bnei Shomayach, Shomema, the children of, uh, des of the desolate one, meaning Jerusalem, we're referring to Jerusalem here, um, and they outnumber, you know, ev everyone who lives in the, in the city, um, Amar Hashem, uh, so says God. And we're introduced to a, a theme, both are Hatarot of Redemption, which we already can identify by the fact that they were chosen as Haftarot for the summer after the shadow of Tisha B'Av, the seven uh, Haftarot of consolation. But we're introduced in the first Haftorah, as we, as we noted in the summer, there are different images of redemption that connote different relationships with God and different forms of redemption. And we're introduced to, to a unique form in this Haftorah, um, Rani Akara, the barren woman. Um, and that is, on the one hand, a relationship with God uh, that is familial, right? That God is in a, a marital relationship with Jerusalem, with the Jewish people, um, and it is, it is that close connection. Um, and at the same time, we also talked about two challenges of exile in the past. Uh, and it, there's the challenge of being 
uh, afflicted in the moment, that exile leads to a precarious state of security, of comfort, of personal sustainability in that moment, right? Think of the Jews being hauled off to exile, right? That is very similar to the Haftorah, the second half of this Haftorah, um, Aniasora, right? The, the afflicted pauper who is storm tossed, who is destitute at the moment, right? There's that challenge. But we also have another challenge that arises from exile. We might be very comfortable where we are, but uh, the, the hope for the future, the opportunity for a future, a future uh, redemption is bleak, right? That our, our, our pain isn't centered in a tormentor in the moment, in the present, but the pain is, tar is centered on the, uh, the lack of opportunity for the future. Think about Abraham who is, and Sarah, who are wealthy, blessed with many gifts from God, and brachot, excuse me, prophecies for the future. But Abraham turns to God and says, what good is this? I don't have any heirs. I don't have any children. There is no future for me, right? Abraham's pain isn't that he's uncomfortable in the moment. Abraham's pain is that there's no future to whatever comfort he has right now. That's a different sort of pain. And we see, actually, when we read it over the summer, we actually read Aniasa Raf first, right? And that is a, the, the pain of the moment, the oppressed person. Um, and we read Rani Akara later, right? Which makes sense. You want to, you know, if, if, if the person can't think about the future if in the moment they're in danger. Um, but both of those are, 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 uh, are, are challenges. Um, and sort of what we, what we begin to see over here is, is two forms of relating to that redemption. We have Rani Akara Lo Yalada. Um, we're told, Jerusalem is told, Harchivi Mekom Alech, elongate, broaden the place of your, of your tents, make your, make your, your threshold large. Um, why? Ki Amin small Tifrotzi, you can turn to the left and you can turn to the right. Um, and, uh, and you'll see that Zarech, your, uh, your, your, um, your, uh, your, your children, your future, the redemption will come and they will, uh, inherit all the Goyim, all the nations of the world. Um, don't be embarrassed anymore. Verse 20, verse four, do not fear, do not be ashamed, right? This is part of the language that we have about Lechadodi, right? This, this is sort of adapted to Lechadodi. And it's later in Lechadodi because Lechadodi begins talking about the moment. And then we're looking at the future. And this is the opportunity for the future redemption. Um, verse number hey, verse five, for your master, your, your husband, um, your maker, God, is going to redeem you. Um, Kiki Isha Azuva, verse number six like a woman who is uh, a, a, a forsaken wife and uh, a melancholy spirit, uh, God will call you and God will uh, create, remake you as his wife of youth. Um, and that you will be, uh, you will be, uh, you'll be, you'll be redeemed. You will have that relationship again. Uh, <laughs> verse number uh, eight. Um, olam. <laughs> And for eternal uh, uh, kindness, God will have mercy on us. Amar Golech Yisrael Hashem. That's what God says, our Redeemer. Kimei Noach Zotli. This is like the main Noach, right? This is the tie into our, our Hatorah, into our Parsha. Um, that God promised that there wouldn't be another main Noach, another flood on the world. Um, because the mountains may falter and the uh, and the hills may 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 fall may move the chasti but God's kindness verse number ten meitach lo yamush your God's uh, kindness from us will never be removed and and the eternal covenant of peace will never be uh, will never be removed from us um, says God our our, our merciful one, our lover, our connected one. And you see in this language that we sort of, you know, pick through, there are two components that really stick out. One is the, the, the affliction point, the pain point is the future, right? 
Jerusalem is sitting barren and desolate. Her children are gone. There's no hope for a future. We're not saying that she's being oppressed right now and that she's being hurt and storm tossed and, 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 and destitute, any, nothing like that. They could, things could be really strong and, and, and wonderful and fortunate. The problem is the future. Her children are gone. The people are exiled. And so God promises this redemption about a future opportunity, that there's a future for Jerusalem. That's point one. That's important to take away from this. Point number two, point number two is what is the type of relationship that God, that the prophet is envisioning in the relationship between God and the people? What type of relationship is it? I'll give you some choices, right? We have the servant master relationship. Is that the language that we have over here? We have the ch parent child relationship. Is that the relationship we have here? We have the spouse relationship about a wife that is barren, that is uh, 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 azuva, that is forsaken and melancholy, and, and that is uh, was for despised, but now will be remade anew and be uh, be uh, have mercy again and have that intimacy again. Right? Which one is it? The last one, where I was just reading from the Torah as the example, right? Um, we, so we see the second, the second important part about this first section is that the relationship that's being mapped out is this relationship of, 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 of marital relationship, right? And you actually, you can see over here, all of these terms, Akara is a barren woman who's obviously in a relationship, a woman who hasn't had birth pains yet, meaning that she's in a relationship that she could have a child. Right, that it is. Uh, uh, we have this idea of the ula, a woman that has been in a relationship that's been consummated. Uh, God is our our maker, our creator, our our master, and our husband. Right, Baal, Kiisha um, Azuva, uh, forsaken woman, um, meaning uh, and an ancient new rim, and a woman of, uh, of of one's youth, a wife of one's youth. Um, all of these are the, are the metaphor that's being described here. Um, so number one, the pain point is the future and the promise of redemption is about the return of a future. Number two, the relationship that's being choreographed here is all about a loving relationship that we have a, we have a, uh, we have a connection to the almighty because we have this intimacy, this closeness, this pre-existing relationship that God will have mercy on us and redeem that relationship, right? Yeah, Steve. You know, what's interesting to me is that here, God is saying, I've deserted you. He's admitted to that. I have deserted you, but now of course I will redeem you and show mercy. I, I want you to, I want to just highlight that point by saying, God is the only one taking action throughout this, right? God left us and God's going to redeem us. Right, let's come back to that. That's an incredibly important point. I didn't want to make that such a strong point until I showed the contrast, but we'll hold on to that and we'll come back to it. Yeah. Okay. So my, my question, I think, is, is perhaps a corollary. So to me, um, this is, uh, verses 9 and 10 do not seem conditional, they, 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 they seem kind of open ended. So I'm just wondering um, is there any commenta uh, commentary vis a vis the various calamities? which have uh, uh, fallen uh, on the uh, Jewish people um, from time to time since, um, uh, since then? Let's hold on to that question. We'll come back to it, okay? That's a good question. It's connected. Now, let's get to the second power of the Haftorah. And, and we'll already note that there's a contrast that's set up here. We know that there's going to be a contrast because in the summer, when we're doing different forms of consolation, of redemption, this Haftorah isn't read together. This after is broken up, right? So we already know that there are two images of redemption that are here. And one of the questions that we're going to ask ourselves is why do we read so long half Torah? Why don't we read the shorter one? Clearly the Spartan opted for that because they thought it sufficed. But we'll come back to that. What is the relationship? Let's ask the same question. What's the pain point? And what's the relationship that's being choreographed in the second part of our after? Aniyah Torah lo, uh, lo nuchama, right? Oh, a storm tossed. Uh, afflicted one, pauper, uh, destitute, right off the bat, is the pain in the moment or is the pain 
an issue about a future. It seems to me right now, right? You're afflicted, you're, so, you're, 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 you're storm tossed, you're poor, you're, you're suffering. Um, God says, don't worry. I'm going to take and lay the foundation stones on pearls and make your foundations rubies. I shall make your, your sun windows of rubies, blah, 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 we'll go on. All your children will learn Torah and establish what, verse 14, B'tzedek, establish yourself to righteousness. Distant yourself from oppression for you need not fear it and, for, and, and from panic for it will not come near you. Verse 15, one, uh, one who fears, one, I'm sorry, one need fear indeed, uh, sorry, I'm skipping, one need fear indeed if he has nothing from me, right? Don't fear if you fear from, if you fear God, right? You don't need to fear if you fear God, you only need to fear if you don't fear God and, and, there's, and you have nothing from God. Um, you know, if you oppress someone, uh, you will fall because of you. Um, uh, we have a little conversation here about idolatry. Don't worship the idolatry. Um, if you uh, are thirsty and you want to experience the filling of God, go. We'll come and you'll get you'll get you'll get that satiation of of that relationship with God. Skipping towards the end, how do we get this? Verse three of chapter fifty-five. Uh, incline your ears and come to me. Listen, and your souls will will rejuvenate. I shall seal an eternal covenant with you, the enduring kindness promised to David. Behold, why? What are, uh, uh, what, what, what are these things? Because you've come to me to light your soul, to, uh, to, to, to rejoice, to learn. Right? And then you'll be, you know, we sort of talked about these verses at the end um, uh, last time. What type of relationship is being described here? Is it a, uh, a, a marriage? Is it a parent-child or is it a servant? Is it a marriage? Have you heard the word Isha or Ishet or Ahuva? Well, no. Right? No, we haven't heard that at all. No, not at all. Right? And we heard about children, not really either. We've heard that you will have children, Virav Shalom Banayek, all your children will be, you know, builders of peace, but those are your children, not God's children, right? What have we heard? We've heard of that you'll go out in the market and you'll buy not bread, you'll be thirsty for the word of God, right? That's very much almost like a, a city setting. God is the sovereign of the city and we are the servants, the serfs in the town. It's a very different relationship that's being described here. We're the pauper that needs to be redeemed in God's kingdom. Right. Um, and, and what we see over here is, is those a huge contract. Number one, that the pain point is in the moment. Number two, the relationship with God is not uh, intimate marital connection. It is where the pauper that needs to be redeemed. We are the servants. Right. And number three, and this really touches to Renana's point and, uh, and, 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 and to Steve's point. Right. What uh, it's conditional. Right. What you have to do, establish yourself with justice, with righteousness, right? You have to go search out God. You have to be thirsty for the word of God. Come to God and your souls will be rejuvenated. You have to come first, right? And so what we see over here is a conditional sort of redemption, right? Which makes sense. There's, we talk about chuva, we talk about redemption, right? It, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. And that we see is the uh, contrast here between the first vision and the second vision of this half Torah, right? Number one, the first one is a marital one. And, 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 and the reason why I'm highlighting the relationship is because I think it speaks to that. Why don't you need uh, to redeem yourself? The relationship between God and the people, the marriage that exists, our pre-existing relationship with God is enough to warrant redemption, Right? The world is going to be redeemed because God has that favor, or the people will be redeemed, because God has that favor that pre-exists in the relationship. That's the foundation of the relationship. The second version of redemption doesn't have that. So let's ask two questions. One is, what's connection to our Parsha? 
And number two, why do we, why do the smart only read the first part? Anything? Let's point out some more differences and then we'll come back to it. Number one, just interesting to point out is that there's a difference between the universality and the intimacy in the, in the two ones, which again, stem from this idea. The first one is very intimate conversation with God and the people. There's no mention about other Goyim, other nations, besides that the, that the people will occupy the space that those Goyim currently, currently occupy. Whereas in the second part, right? Look at the end, Zalid and Hey, Heng Goyim, Lo Yadat right? There are other nations that will be involved. You're going to be part of the, the League of Nations, the, the, the community of the world. Um, and, and they'll be part dragged along as well. There's a universal bend to the second part, which then fits into this notion that's all about uh, it's because we're deserving of the relationship as a servant of God. Whereas there's an intimacy that is, that is created in the first vision of redemption, which fits beautifully with the notion that there's a husband and wife here. Um, even the, even the, the moments of greatness or of, of skill that's described, if you look in the second part on, on Iyas Ora, when it calls for redemption, we also talk about the heritage of what we've done in the past, right? Look at verse 17. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord of God, right? This is the gift of their righteousness appointed to me, by me, excuse me, says the Lord, right? What are we talking about over here? We're talking about the fact that they did things, their actions that made them deserving, that, they, that were turning to the people and say, you can do this. You've done this in the past. You can do this again, right? Aniaso Ra is all about earning it and that you can earn it. And that we trust that you can earn it because you've done it in the past. Is there any notion of earning your keep as a husband or a wife? Well, that's, that's far into the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. it's, intimacy is there inherently because of the relationship. Now let's get back to it. The Svardim only read the first Haftorah. The Haftorah that is about an intimate relationship with God. The Haftorah that's about a future. The pain point is it now, it's the future. The Haftorah that says you don't have to earn it. The relationship between you and God is enough to create redemption. It happens to mention Noah, but it's so much more than that. Why is Noah saved in our portion? Why is humanity saved in our portion? Is Noah the greatest guy in the world? So it depends how you look at the commentaries, but there's a large group of commentaries that think Noah's not the greatest guy in the world. And we have all these midrashim that the rabbis build that describe that Noah is really redeemed because God either matzachain, right, which is explicit in the Torah, that God found favor in Noah's sight. He didn't deserve it, but there was a relationship between God and humanity. God couldn't just destroy humanity. There needed to be some remnant. And Noah was the one who, you know, was uh, ideally situated, right? It's part of actually why the centerpiece of our Rosh Hashanah davening, we bring up Noah. Right, and we talk about Noah, right? Not just to give a universal aspect to our tefillah, but Noah represents a transition from din, from judgment, to mercy. God had mercy on the people and needs to find a way to save humanity. Noah's the conduit to that, right? The Midrash says that Noah was kept alive. God tells me you have to feed the animals. The root of him feeding the animals is why Noah was saved, right? And one day when Noah is a little late to feed the animals. Right, the lion mauls him, right? There's a famous Midrash about that. that Noah had a limp because one day he was late to feed the animals. Do we really care how the animals, Noah wasn't smart enough to put up a fence so the lion didn't maul him? What is this Midrash telling us? This Midrash is telling us that Noah's 
salvation was not because he was the most righteous person in the world. It was salvation because of the context of the relationship between God and humanity, that there needed to be this bridge of chesed, of kindness, of rachamim, of mercy, of chayin, of favor, that Noah needed to earn, but it needed to be there regardless of whether Noah earned it or not, because humanity needed to be saved. It was inherent in the relationship, the deal that God made when God created humanity, so to speak. So we read this Torah because it echoes that. And the Psalms say, only read that vision of redemption, because that is the core of what is Noah's all about. Yes, it mentions the words Noah, but the prophet is, it mentions the words of Noah because the motif matches so nicely with what we're trying to describe with Noah, right? Now, why do we read the whole rest of the section? Oh, probably because we want to get to uh, 21 verses, but also because as Ashkenazim, the contrast only sharpens the point of the first part, right? If we read the second Torah, then the second part of that Torah, which has the same water motif, Aniyato Ra, this, it's connected, but it's a different, not only does it give us a different view of a relationship with God, but it sharpens what we would have missed if we just read it on its own. If we just read it on its own, we're not going to be as sensitive to the fact that there's no call, that you have to earn it, that it's not about the intimacy that fuels the relationship, that there's this Isha, Baala connection between that. It's only when we read another vision of redemption that you have to earn, that you're a servant and a master that is about other factors that all of a sudden we read that first part more closely and say, oh, this is the relationship. This is the redemptive spirit that, is, that, that fills the book of the, the story of Noah. So I think, I think that's what the Torah is telling us. I think that's the parallel here. In some ways, it's almost as if, um, it's almost as if the, for the Svartim, it's sufficient to just read Aniyatora, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Rani Akara, but, and not Aniyatora, but there's a greater logic for us to read Aniyatora with it because it adds another perspective, another model that is a foil to the redemptive picture, which the first model did. So we have two models of redemption here. The second model is really serving to sharpen the first model. And the first model is what underscores the redemptive activity, not just that the prophet is talking about, but underscores the redemptive drive that powers the entire Noah story. All right, that's part two. All right, we talked about, we have two parts. We did part two, let's talk about part one. Everyone with me? Everyone understand? Two models of redemption, different in relationship, different in the pain point, different in so many different pieces, different in needing to earn it or not. Noah represents one of those models, that first model, and the second model is a greater contrast, a sharp foil for what we could have, what we could read. Also, we get to 21 verse. All right, so that's, that's our half Torah big picture, right? We looked at it separately each time. We sort of read through it and saw it connected. Last year when we, last year when we talked about Pashat Noah, we saw why are these Haftorahs good together, right? Why are these two sections good together? We talked about the water metaphors and the puns that tie us together and the vision of redemption that are connected. Over the summer, we developed why each of these are unique stories of redemption. And today we've looked at these two unique stories of redemption brought together, not to be one unit, but to contrast with one another to underline the form of redemption that Noah saw about, all right? We'll have to see what we'll do in the, the fifth iteration of this Um, You know, this, you know, uh, the, what, there's that joke about uh, the, the, the Jewish astronaut that goes to space, that finally comes back and it's a big celebration and everyone's whatever, and the Jewish astronaut is exhausted. And they, they ask him, why are you so tired? Now everyone else is tired. He goes, you go up there and you have to have Shachas Mithamar, Shachas Mithamar, Shachas Mithamar. Right, because they're constantly, they keep constantly going around the world. <laughs> same thing is true. In the time that it will take us to do each of these Haftorah a second time, we will do this Haftorah six times. So we'll, we'll have to figure out what, what, uh, what's going on. Let's look together at verse seven and eight. Um, and let's look a little bit just at, uh, I just want to show you one feature of the commentary here, which sort of helps us highlight a, uh, a question 
that we uh, a, a form of, of of translation of interpretation that we need to look at. So verse seven and eight is in the first part of that Torah. Uh -huh. Now we've talked about how in 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 in, in biblical poetry, one of the telltale signs of biblical poetry is the repetition, the um, repetition, um, and almost like a pair, right? The couplet, right? So you have uh, all different examples. You think about, you know, um, and, 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 and it's not just repetition, it's more, excuse me, the word, but more accurately, parallelism, right? Azinu Hashemayim Vadebera. Listen, oh, oh, uh, sky, and I will speak. And the ground, hear the language, I'm, and the words of my mouth, right? The couplets, and the couplets, the parallelism can be in different ways. It can, uh, it can intens intensify, right? There are times where we have parallelism that intensifies. There are times where we have parallelism that um, is, is, uh, um, is opposite, oppositional. And there are times where it's just parallels. Um, and there are different ways to look at it. And those parallels uh, help us understand different things. Um, let me give uh, some example. Hold on a second. It's funny that these two parts, for Sukim, and it really is parallel. Can you see it? All right, hold on a second. Seven and eight. All right, I'll give you an example, right? I've been merciless, and now I'm going to be merciful. Both of them. I'll give you another example. Breshi, not a forty-nine, uh, six. I have actually a source sheet. I gave a, I gave a class on this. Hold on, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see the word document? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the Sodom, uh, the Sodom Al Tavo Nafshi, in their in their inner council. My soul shouldn't uh, join. Um, my uh, this is the curse to Levi and Shimon. Um, and you see over here the comparison. You know, it's two different, two different ways of saying the same thing. In there, uh, so it is like the internal council of, uh, of 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 the people of Jacob. Jacob doesn't want to be broken into. And in their congregation, in their gathering, he doesn't want to be included. Ask your father and tell them, uh, and, and, and he will tell you. Um, the wise people of your town, uh, and they will tell you. Um, but there are different examples of, of, uh, of parallelism. Um, if you look at the second chapter of Shira Shirim, I'll just give one more example and then we'll, we'll, we'll describe what we're doing. And all of these, it's important to note that these are uh, forms of poetry, right? It's not in the prose that this comes up. So the second chapter of Shira Shirim, for those who want to... Um, look in your art scroll, it's 1263, although I'm looking now and it'll be totally unhelpful because they don't interpret it literally. I am the rose of Sharon. Shoshanat Hamakim, the rose, I'm the flower of Sharon, the rose of the, um, yeah, this isn't a great example for what I'm trying to show. Anyways. We'll come back to it in a second. All right. So let's look at these verses together. Verse seven, verse eight. So what what does it say? How many people have the art scroll in front of them? Anyone have not art scroll? Or right, I have a different one. So we'll we'll see how how they read together. Right? So read for me verse number seven, anyone? In English, you can. For for but a brief moment have I forsaken you, and with abundant mercy shall I gather you in. So what's That's the how, what's what's the parallelism there? The the parallelism is that he 
God has forsaken you and then shown mercy? So first of all, you have the, the, the leaving. The leaving and then, right? yeah. And the gathering. So those are uh, oppositional. Uh -huh. uh, and, then, and then you have the regakaton in a small moment, God forsake us. Uh -huh. And in great mercy, God gathered us in. So yep. There's a little question. What is this Berega Katon in, in a small moment? So uh, the, um, the, the Radak on this, on this uh, component, right? Exactly what you just said, right? Even though, uh, even though it's for a moment, that's the case. And that's, that's, that, that, that's, that's that's how it's understood and then read that in context with verse number eight the shet of tessa in a slight moment of anger uh god distanced god's face from us mm -hmm. um olam and in internal endless kindness right uh, oppositional to that moment of uh of, of distance God's mm -hmm. kindness will be, will be, will have mercy on us forever, right? It's just interesting, by the way, um, you see that vav in the middle of each of these couplets, that's an oppositional vav, right? Um, there are times where that sets up as a, as a, a great indicator of shal v'yicha v'yagetcha, zikhenecha v'yomruach, right? There's no vav there. Hazinu ha-shmayim v'azebera, tishma aret imrim, the tishma aret Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. But sometimes, a lot of times that vav signals the oppositional parallelism as opposed to the, the parallelism that builds momentum. That's how the Radak says. And the Radak basically says in this, in this second verse, right? Zeh pasuk, kenyan ha-pasuk harishon. This is a similar point as the verse before it, right? Ela she-kafel ha-nyan dililim shono. The chazik ha-nyan. And that we repeated the the, the notion bimilim shono in different words, the chazik ha'inyan, to strengthen this idea that God turned away for a moment in anger. I'm sorry, God turned away for a moment and forsake us. In a short flare of anger, He hit God hid God's face from us. But birachamecha rabim, birachamim gedolim. Excuse me for many. For, for, for vast love and mercy, God will bring us back. And the chesed olam, and not just great, gedolim is great, but olam is everlasting. That's so much more than, than vast and great, right? What's, what's greater, a gadol or a everlasting portion? Clearly the everlasting portion. So the two verses eternally are parallel, internally are parallel, excuse me, and are parallel within each other, that they intensify each other. Right, that's what the Redak says. And it comes in the Ibn Ezra, another commentary looking at this verse and says, ah, it's not the way parallelism works, right? He's uncomfortable with this. The Ibn Ezra says, there needs to be an internal parallelism within the verse. And how can it be, um, how can it be that the Rega Katan, a moment of, of uh, a short moment, is parallel to Berachamim Dolim. That does, that's not parallel to each other. So he changes it. And he says, Yeshapiresh ki hu min roga hayam. An anger of the sea. Uh, he's showing us a different, a different time where the, the Shoresh, Resh, Gimel, Ayin can mean anger. And therefore, it's the ha'ed uberachamim, and it's oppositional to the rachamim. So the the Ibn Ezra reads this as with 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 anger, God left us, and with great mercy, God. I'm sorry, with 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 vast mercy, God will bring us back. Bishetef Ketef, verse eight. In a slight flare of anger, God hid God's face from us. And for redemption of eternal redemption, God will uh, have mercy on us. So it's not a parallel to the previous verse. It's building up even more. God left us for a moment, and God will 
redeem us with great, I'm sorry, God left us in a fit of anger for, for a, a, a fit of anger and God will redeem us with great love and that God turned God's face only for a moment. The, the amount of time is only for a moment and only in the second verse and forever eternal God's chesed will give us redemption. Now, is this the most essential way of how to read this verse and will have implications that impact everything that we do in our lives? Without a doubt, not, right? Without a doubt, not. This is a question of how do we translate the words? But what's fascinating that I just want to highlight here that we have the opportunity because we looked at this hot source so many times is that really in each verse, sometimes we have this question and the commentators struggle to make exact sense of what this means. And they do contribute to a much broader theme. But over here, we see that what's pushing the commentary to translate differently in each place is a question about how we understand the parallelism. Is there a parallelism structure between the two verses or is there a parallel structure that's internal in each verse, right? And that's sort of what we have oh. this debate between the Radak uh, and the Ibn Ezra, two commentaries of great note in interpreting our, our uh, Haftorah or this line of our Haftorah. It's just a taste of what um, theoretically every line could be about. You don't always get a chance to look at it, but A, we get to talk about parallelism, and B, we get to understand how they're both using different uh, principal positions to push them to translate, interpret these verses differently. All right, so I guess we'll stop here. Thank you, welcome back, and thank you for joining us. And, thank you. Uh, we'll, uh, thank, thank you very much. much.